I want to know, Kieran, if you were giving advice to somebody listening, somebody's like, hey, I'm a founder, I'm a marketing leader, I believe in what I'm doing, I believe that we can build a cult brand. We, I, I buy it into what you're selling. What would the, be the first couple of things you would tell them to do? Tell them to think about actions to take. Hey, hey, welcome to another episode of Marketing Against the Green. I'm your co-host, Kip Bodner. I'm joined as always by my co-host, Kieran Flanagan. And today, do we have a subject for you guys? Today, we are talking about cult brands. And Kieran, you and I were kind of back-channeling about show ideas. And one of the things that we kind of got to was, wow, coming out of a pandemic, people are looking for something and someone to believe in. There's like a dearth of leadership. And it seems like there's, you know, the, my hot take to get us started off is that there's probably never been a better time to start a cult brand than today because people are so in search of something to believe in. Do you agree with that take? Do you disagree? Like, where are you at on it? I think there's never been as good of a time as now to create. Well, I think there's been certain periods of time in our history that has been a great, incredible time to create a cult full stop. <laughs> so, <laughs> We're going to so get into like, that. We can't talk yeah. about the cult brands without the cult so, part. We're going to get into that. The cult part. So uh, I agree. I think people, like if you look at why people join cults, yes, right? there's four, four core reasons. If you look at kind of the study of cults, which is societal problems, belonging, low self-esteem and purpose. Hold and on. I think, go, go, go back through those and go back through those slower. I think it's important <laughs> that everybody listening, they didn't think they were going to get a lesson in cults today on the show, but they oh, are. We're going to go deep on cults. So, so, so give us the four reasons somebody joins a cult. Right. People join cults. And if you think about where we are today as a species, societal problems, well, we have loads of those, but you join a cult because they offer solutions to the things people dislike about society, politics. <laughs> There's a lot of like politics there that we don't need yeah, to get into. Totally. Belonging, like mm. people desire to be part of something. There's actually a real, you know, I think sense of belonging there's lots of changes in the world that are changing the way people feel about their belonging in the world. Like remote work is one of them. I'm an oh, totally. advocate for remote work, but your belonging used to be in the office. And I don't think that is actually a good thing, but all of these shifts in the world have changed the way people think about their belonging. There, there's a desire to be part of something. There's one that's like low self-esteem. And so you see that in a lot of cults where they kind of prey on people that have low self-esteem. They want to be part of something. They want to feel very good. That can be seen as a negative, but it's also a real positive. Like some brands can really help people mm -hmm. see the better in themselves. So I think that's always a negative. And then purpose. Like one of the big things that cults give people is purpose. They offer something that makes people feel good. And if I looked at building a cult brand, I think belonging and purpose and low self-esteem in the positive sense, not the yeah, negative and, sense. And what was the first one again? Societal Ooh. problems. That is a trickier one for like a brand to be taken into account when they're kind of building their kind of tribe. Yeah, so what I'm trying to go through for people is to take those four reasons why people join a cult and line them up with brands today that we think are cult <laughs> brands that take advantage of that opportunity. Like the last one, purpose, like I think of Nike. Nike is about helping you find your purpose. Just do it like working out like that is about purpose. And I think that Nike is a great example of purpose. I think belonging, I'm, I agree with you that most cult brands are about belonging. I especially yes. think like fitness brands, like I love Peloton. Peloton. I think Peloton is a cult brand around belonging. When I think about low self-esteem, I think about fashion as like, you know, I think you have cult brands like Chanel or Gucci that really feed to the self-esteem side of being a cult. Do you have any examples of like not happy with society? I think all of populist politics. Well, politics, but put politics aside. I'm talking about a real brand that people would know. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to throw one out there and see if you agree with me or not. Okay. Yeah, maybe you need to throw one out and I'll see if I agree. Patagonia. Oh, that's actually Patagonia, no, Patagonia. is tackling a, okay. the societal problems, global warming, but, donating their who, their funds, all of that. Who is Patagonia's? Who's like one of the wearers of Patagonia that they're most kind of associated with? Which is like VCs, <laughs> yeah, venture capitalists, <laughs> and Wall Street. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know, like like that's probably not the kind of 
you know, Democrats. But, but I think it. if you were going to make an argument for any brand under that, like not hap- societal change, I think Patagonia is the best one because I think we believe that's the hardest cult to belong in. So the first thing think, we're trying to unpack here is like, there are four reasons why you would b- belong to a cult. And there are actually four ways that you would build a cult brand, right? I think there probably are companies that tackle environmental issues, like a lot of the mm-hmm. climate change companies that actually health? will be in health. Will be I in think health is the, uh, all the anti-obesity companies. There's yeah. an awesome company Levels out there that does like glucose tracking, for example. Like that is a, I'm unhappy with society and my health. You know, I think there are ways to build a cult brand in the societal problems. I think it's harder, but, and if you get it right, you probably have bigger upside where belonging is probably easier, but because it's easier, it's more competitive to build right. that type belonging of cult and brand. Belonging and purpose are the two most common. Belonging and purpose. Totally agree. For sure. Okay. So those are the four reasons somebody joins a cult. We've learned other things about cults, Kieran. Drop some more cult knowledge on us today. Let me take you all the way back to the 1800s to a sociologist called Max Weber. So Max Weber was a sociologist in the 1800s, and he did this really incredible study on cults. Okay. Now, one of his like core takeaways was cults are based on a charismatic leader. Everyone kind of understands that. But the charismatic leader followed this thing called the routinization of charisma. And okay, I this so was, hold on, re- repeat that again. I want everybody to really understand this. This is an important concept. Routinization of charisma. And I want to explain the routinization of charisma because it's really interesting to think about how you build companies today. And it's based that the these kind of cult brands have some sort of charismatic authority that threatens boundaries set by traditional institutions, right? Ooh. Or rational authority. So basically it challenges the status quo. And because it challenges that status quo, it becomes revolutionary, right? But what I think is fascinating from his studies is Usually what happens is that that charismatic authority, that the things that those yeah. people believed, if they are successful, get incorporated into society. And so the challenge it presents to society begins to subside, right? You have this charismatic leader, challenges the status quo, people agree, those, some of those things get institutionalized into society. And so the challenge it presents to society is no longer there, it subsides. And so the way the way in which that happened is called routinization. And what I think is fascinating about that is if you think of all transformational brands or all cult mm-hmm. brands, do they eventually just become born and routine, right? <laughs> Like if you actually they do. Win, they do. They do. Like think of Facebook, right? People hate Facebook now. Think of Google. Well, I don't think Facebook was ever a cult brand. A better, better example is I, Red Bull. Let's talk about Red Bull. Red Bull is a cult brand. Do you think Red Bull's boring now? I think it is. I don't think it's boring, but I think it is more boring than it was 10 years than ago. It, than it was 10 years ago. You don't think Facebook was a cult? No, I think it was a popular brand. product. I don't ever think Maybe it's a, a cult popular brand. Pro- okay. No, I don't think they've ever earned that status. Yeah, I think um, if you look at Pepsi and Coke in the 90s versus Pepsi and Coke today. Oh, yeah. They're way, like, way more boring and way more way, way more assimilated than they were in the 90s, for sure. You know, popularity kind of kills. Like, I used to have this friend and we would always compare music, right? Yeah. And I would, like, listen to a lot of hip-hop. And I would have hip-hop artists that were, like, cool. And he would have hip-hop artists that are no one ever heard of. And as soon as any of his got popular, he thought they sucked, all right? Popularity kills cult brands in some respects. And I think that's the balance is like when you become very popular, it's really hard to keep that kind of challenger ethos that you stood for. So I think that that is like one thing that I thought was kind of fascinating is like all culture follow that kind of paradigm. What I think is really interesting about this is for a cult to really work, you have to have a charismatic leader, but that leader's core beliefs have to become routine for everybody who belongs to that cult. And at the core of them is counterculture. They are, they're challenging the status right. quo. They are challengers by, by nature, right? And the hard thing about that, especially on the brand perspective, is once you get enough people who want to challenge the status quo, you become the status quo. And that's, yes. that's where yeah. fads are created. Right? right? Where you like, oh, you have this period of time where this thing is popular, and then it basically gets oversaturated to the point where it's no longer popular and kind of falls off, right? right? And the great long-term cult brands build new levels of ways to challenge the status quo through their product and through their through their marketing, right? Like the best example of this is like, if you think about music in the 1990s, for example, like Nirvana, Pearl Jam, all of these bands, they were terrified of what? Selling out. They were terrified of becoming mainstream because if they became mainstream, 
then they wouldn't have the cool factor, the challenger factor. And I think underpinning all that, they were afraid they were just going to burn out and not last because people were going to get oversaturated of them, right? And I think you can kind of, all cult brands have a really clear enemy, right? They yes. have to have something that they can challenge. Like if you don't have a very clear enemy that people can resonate with and feel a certain way about it, then you're not going to build a really great cult brand. You're not going to build a transformational company. You have to have a very clear enemy that people can actually kind of, it really resonates with people. And I think that's the challenge in the status quo. Yeah, look, I think what you're saying there is right. You know, on one hand, I think you have cult brands. And on the other hand, I think you have what I'm going to call boring brands, right? And they kind of share the opposite characteristics, right? Like a cult brand, there's a reason to b believe belong. That's, that's one of those four reasons we talked about. Societal malcontent, belonging, self-esteem. I forget the fourth one now. <laughs> purpose. Purpose. That's Societal, right. belonging, low self-esteem, purpose. Purpose, right? So the, the, those are the cult brand side of things. On the boring brand side of things, you believe in their product. Cult brands, oh, have deep emotion. Boring brands right. don't have any emotion. Right. And like right. you can kind of keep going through that heuristic. And that's why it, like the, the third one there is cult brands challenge the status quo. Boring brands tried to capitalize on the status quo, maintain the status, quo. maintain the status quo. And so when we're talking, having this discussion today, we're talking about being a cult brand. You have to be clear of what the core characteristics, the core first principles of being a cult brand are, because if you don't have those right, nothing else matters from there. And I think you are giving people a really good blueprint of what they need to build a great long-term cult brand. Right. The other fascinating thing I found from some of these studies that sociologists did was there was a, an American who went to live with a cult in California, mm -hmm. and they actually studied the way that the cult promoted itself to new members and how they actually, so like distribution, how to actually acquire new members. And they found that actually all of their efforts really weren't that impactful. The only <laughs> thing that truly mattered was the cult members themselves spread in the word to like friends and family. Mm. And like it was like, you know, there's really well oiled referral loop. And so the more you can kind of expand within that network, the quicker the cult grew. And I think that does speak to that sense of like purpose and belonging. So I'll give you a really good example of a please, brand please. where people, if, when you do the thing, the first rule is you can't stop talking about that thing. And so like, I used to be part of this cult, uh, which I still love, and I think can fit into belonging and low self-esteem is CrossFit. Oh yeah. The first rule of CrossFit is you talk to everyone about doing CrossFit, right? That is like- <laughs> Is that, that what is they tell you? It. Seriously? No, <laughs> that's what, that's what like, when you're, I, I don't know, there's just something about it. Like so I got like drafted into the CrossFit cult through mm -hmm. other friends that I knew, and they would talk to me about it all the time. And then I was like, oh, these people talk about CrossFit all the time. This is ridiculous. And then mm -hmm. I joined and all I would talk about to everyone was like doing CrossFit. And uh, the origins of CrossFit actually are super interesting. Like their, their founder, who is an ex-gymnastic, yeah. the reason he invented, his name is uh, Glassman. The reason he invented CrossFit was because he was looking for this thing called the feeling. And the feeling was this state of nirvana where you were you had done exercise to the point where you were gasping, near vomiting, mm -hmm. uh, so exhausted that you just like could hardly stand up. And you had this sense of euphoria and that's actually why he created crossfit and it spread through like the actual military and police forces before it became mainstream but crossfit is a really good example of like the distribution of crossfit is really like members who go out and recruit you know not purposely but just by continually talking about their experience with CrossFit and drafting people back into that brand. Well, CrossFit is a great example of an element of, of a cult brand that we haven't yet talked about, Karen. When you talk about, you talked about the routinization of charisma. How do you make charisma and the beliefs of something a routine? And the way you do that is through a very regular process, right? And so for example, with CrossFit, what did they do? They posted a workout each day. They had a daily workout that you right. could, you, that as long as you had access to the internet and could get what the daily workout was, you could do it by yourself. You could do it with some friends. You could meet up at a gym. But like everybody had this 
catalyzing point around this daily workout where that was the thing everybody talked about. And they had a new thing to talk about every day. The same thing happens in organized religion, right? Like if you're a Christian, you have Sunday church service, right? And you go to, you go to church on Sunday, right. you learn, and then you go and evangelize the following week, the things you learned at church service, right? And so if you're a brand out there thinking about what's happening, the consistency of the routinization of charisma is very important. What is the one thing that is consistent every day or every week that your community can galvanize around and right. subsequently evangelize around? If you don't have that, they don't have anything to share. They don't have anything to talk about, right? It is that ritual. The ritual is the issue. And so it's, right. you know, it's not just routinizing Charisma, it's also making a routine out of rituals, you know? Yeah, that's kind of that's, that's, that's kind of stupid because rituals are inherently routine, so I don't know why I said it that way. <laughs> but, like, creating rituals are a critical part of a cult brand. No, that's a great point. CrossFit, the daily workouts are a way that the entire community can do the same thing, regardless of where you are in the world, and interact with each other and talk about that and share their time. The other thing that CrossFit does that is super interesting and may not be universal to all CrossFit gyms, but for the most part, unlike gyms, they don't have mirrors. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, you are not really focused on yourself. You're focused on other people. I love and that. And so they really instill a sense of competitiveness. And that's what drives, like it's that com competitiveness that drives yeah. the kind of love of CrossFit and the kind of spread of CrossFit. Well, competitiveness so is, is, is their viral mechanic, right? Right. It's like, oh, because I'm competitive, I'm going to talk to you or I'm going to try to recruit you so I can come and beat you here, right? Like, like I want, I want to be better their than times. You. They share their workouts, how good they did. Like, there's just this like really nice way to uh, continually get people, like to your point, like there's a daily thing that everyone can do and there's a way that people can verbalize the impact of that and how they did in a way that like drags other people into that competitive spirit. Yep, I love that. I think CrossFit is a great example of something that's on the borderline between a cult brand and an actual like cult. Right. And I, and I mean right. that in like the nicest way possible. I don't, we're not here to like give cults like a negative connotation. We're trying to say like, this is how a group of people comes together around a shared purpose and how you could build a brand in that same way. Yeah. There was a lot of um, studies that showed the, again, we're not here to debate the, the good cults, bad cults, but there was a lot of studies that had shown that there are like cult has a negative connotation, but there's a lot of studies to show that people who find some sort of cult, which they belong to and cult can mean anything. It actually means many different things. It's not mm -hmm. just the ones that you see up on the news. And there's like studies to show that people who join things that they feel true belonging to have that sense of purpose are actually much happier, live much longer, all of these different things. All and the studies so, uh, show that the way to be unhappy is loneliness and right. the way to be happy is belonging. And so why, anything that facilitates belonging in a positive way, I think is good for people, right? Right. Go find your cult. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame us when it's bad. Yeah. <laughs> but, it's, but, it, but in all seriousness, like that, that is a breakdown for, you know, the reasons you would join a cult, a lot of the mechanics behind it. I thought Kieran gave a great example of CrossFit. But Kieran, like given that we know all of that now, what makes you believe that like today – is such an amazing opportunity to build a truly cult brand. Well, I think I think if you look at it, um, there's never been so many interesting ways to connect with your audience, like the different platforms, the ways mm -hmm. we can create content, the way you can tell your story. Like back in the day, it was not that easy to tell the story. Like if you look at the way that we're going to do an episode of this, but the way the Pepsi and Coke grew into a, yeah. a cult brand, they were just incredible at advertising. But that advertising comes at a cost. Like there's a lot of totally. money behind that. It's really only for companies who can afford to do that. Today, you can do it through like TikTok videos, <laughs> right? right? Totally. Like which are for the most part free. You can do it through all of these different channels. So I think that we have access to channels that, and ways to tell our stories that we have never been able to do before. I think that it has never been so competitive. Like we've talked about this on the show already in previous shows that building product has become commoditized. Distribution is where all the leverage is, right? Mm -hmm. And so you need to actually have a real way to create a community and tribe around your product. And that means you do really need to think coherently about, oh, I have a like clear enemy. I have reasons why this is important to do now. I have people who are going to feel very passionately that this is the right thing to do, but I'll probably have naysayers as well. And I think you need to have that kind of structure and feeling because it's really hard to just create another product. Like I'm just another product. I do some things like table stakes and something's better. It's going to be really hard to like build a meaningful business that way. And I think to your point, like we're just in an era where 
if the if the large platforms like Meta and stuff like that do start to become debundled, then you do have a lot of people who are looking for another sense of belonging online, like digital communities. And I think one of the arguments you can make is communities will become unbundled from these large platforms and instead we'll find like much more niche places to hang out. And Reddit that. is a really good example because it's been segmented into like lots of niche forums. Mm -hmm. But I think that's another opportunity where brands can can own, you know, like a little niche community. There's one, I did a post on LinkedIn yesterday and there's a guy called Paul Rutzer who has uh, always been a great partner for HubSpot. But he has a small community of like 35, well, it's not small, 35,000 people who all love AI, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's just these ways to get people who are passionate, have purpose, want a sense of belonging that are not being serviced by these kind of large conglomerates. I love that. Uh, but if we, if you, let's say you and I agree and the audience agrees that this is one of the better times in history to build a cult brand because of a sense of belonging and what you were just talking about was essentially a decentralization, a disaggregation of community and experience. Why don't we have more cult brands? What what stops a brand from becoming a cult brand in your mind? Well, I think we actually do. So what I think we have a lot of cult brands, but I think the only one- I don't think we do. I completely disagree. I think we have well, a handful let, of cult brands. Let me go through some. So like, you can only really be a cult brand if you are a category creator, I think, right? Like, Ooh. Look, look at do you think that's true? Let's let's debate that. So there's, there's a finite number of these brands that exist. Lemonade Insurance is a really good example of a brand that is, has some cultish kind of, like it fits some of the criteria, has a very clear enemy, yeah. right? They have a very clear enemy in traditional insurance. Superhuman, you could yeah. argue like had a really good, like had built up a real cult around its product. Their enemy was like Gmail. They're the fastest email experience ever. Notion is another one of these brands. It really depends how we define what we call a cult brand. But I do think you have brands that manage to forge a lot of traction for their business by having a very clear enemy and have a very clear sense of purpose belonging on why people would use their product and join that community. Okay, okay. Let's, let, let's debate this. I do not think you need to be a category creator, create a new category of product or service to be a cult brand. What I think you need to be a cult brand is you need to stand for one of the four reasons people join a cult, right? And again, for brands, it's often going to be belonging or purpose. You then need to have a clear enemy. And just because you have an enemy does not mean that you are starting a new category for example give me, give me an example of a company that you would call a cult brand that is not a category leader oh category leader versus category creator is a different thing okay give me an example then oh that's good so we could debate this point so I, you could be right in that i need to think through it give me an example of a brand that's a cult brand that's a category leader but not a category creator well i, I actually think most of them are pioneers right which is red bull nike lululemon like I guess they kind of redefine categories. Like athleisure yeah. was around before Lululemon, but they made athleisure cool and mainstream, right? Like, you know, energy drinks we, were around yeah. before Red Bull, but Red Bull repackaged the experience around energy drinks. I'm trying to think yeah. if there's like a really good example of somebody who just did a better better mousetrap business and made it a cult brand. Yeah, that's my point. I guess category leader can actually, I think category creator gets misconstrued with a bunch of other things. I actually meant more, I think what you're saying is like redefine categories yes. or, pi yes. or a pioneer. I don't think you, I'm basically saying you cannot be a cult brand if you just enter an existing category and run a better yes. kind of playbook there. You have to redefine something. There has to be something like, differentiated in your product like yes. even you have to have a clear enemy one, and you have to have be clear on the emotion you want people to feel against that enemy right, right. the only ones i could think that again we're going to do a full episode on this so stay tuned for future episodes on the cola wars is the cola wars because pepsi yeah. and coke maybe coke actually was the category creator and pepsi was the challenger brand they're both just like sugar water that I still cannot wrap my head around that people actually drink that shit. <laughs> so um, bad, it's so bad. <laughs> I've literally never, I've whole, never drunk it. We're gonna get all the soda drink drinkers rilling yeah. against us on this in yeah. that oh, future episode, I, man. But they're, they're like Pepsi have created a cult brand through incredible, incredible advertising. Yeah. And they were not, they were definitely a challenger brand. Like their whole, their whole 
marketing strategy was basically a comparable and, and strategy. Well, so, hold on, but let, let me try something on you, though, as it relates to this. Put put Pepsi and Coke and stuff aside. We're, we're going to talk about those in, 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 really soon on a future episode. You can be a challenge, you can be a cult brand, but to be a cult brand, you either need to have a very differentiated product and marketing experience, or you have to have a product that is nothing, like a can of sugar water, that you just create a full experience around. Like you cannot yeah. have a product that's like all of the others and just try to make it slightly cooler. Yeah, right? Pepsi is a great example. They basically created the Pepsi generation and the sugar water Pepsi was like in the background. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like it totally. really wasn't about the product. I want, I want to play a game in, in a minute as when we get closer to wrapping up. But before we get to we get to the game, I want to know, Kieran, if you were giving advice to somebody listening, somebody's like, hey, I'm a founder, I'm a marketing leader, I believe in what I'm doing, I believe that we can build a cult brand. We can do it, do it now. I, I buy it into what you're selling. What would the, be the first couple of things you would tell them to do, tell them to think about actions to take? I'll start with... I'll come back to the enemy because we've kind of talked about that. But the the one I really like is you have to foster a sense of belonging and, in, and individualism. So there's this yes. book called The Cultin of Brands by Douglas Atkins. And he has this really cool theory in it called the cult paradox, which he highlights that people feel most like themselves when they're part of a group, right? Humans mm -hmm. are actually much more safer in groups and feel much more safer in groups. However, the initial drive to join a cult is to discover uh, and clarify one's individualism, right? Not to belong. So you first join something because you want to clarify your own individualism mm -hmm. and the way you think about yourself. And then you actually stay because you have a sense of belonging and you feel safe within that group. And if you actually think about how you build a brand, it's like, I am first trying to position the product and how, it tra how it's transformative for you. What are the benefits for you? Mm -hmm. How do you feel different from using this product? And then you are gonna stay because I've built up a community who all foster that same idea about themselves and feeling about themselves and feel transformative in that way. And oh, cool, these people think like me. This is how I feel about this product. These are the benefits that I see for the product. This is how I see myself when I use this product. All these other people see themselves through the same lens. And I really like thinking about that. How, how do I sell, position the product for you? And then how do I make sure you stay? Because there's yeah. a whole community of people like you attached to our brand. I think that's exactly right. I think that's the right advice to give everybody. And I think if you are out there listening and you want to build a cult brand or watching want to build a cult brand, what I would tell you is be prescriptive about it and have a clear ritual, right? Like I think Kieran gave you some great advice. You've got to have a clear enemy, you have to have clear emotion, but you also have to have a clear ritual that your community and your cult ostensibly is going to do with you and going to do with each other, right? Because you have to foster that sense of belonging because that's what's not just going to bring people together, but it's what's going to keep people together. And I think that that's right. that's really awesome. I have one last question Please. to kind of throw out. Please. Get your, get your feelings on it. We started the whole conversation with the routinization of charisma and we talked about the fact that there's this charismatic authority or there's a charismatic leader, how much, how important do you think it is for brands or B2B brands or tech brands to have a charismatic leader? Like, can you succeed today if you don't have an Elon or someone like that who is like very much at the forefront and like very, whatever your feelings on him are, garners a lot of attention or is it the brand itself? Like I was trying to think through that when I, you know, wrote out the question, should cult brands have a cult leader, a figurehead? Is that good or bad? I'm going to give you my take. And it's probably a, it's probably a little spicy, which is I've been very clear during this show to not talk about charisma and charismatic people because like, I actually don't even know what the hell char charisma is, right? Like charisma is this vapid thing that people talk about. And when I mm -hmm. think about what you actually need in a leader, you need a, a leader with a strong point of view and beliefs right? Yes. Like that they yeah. know what is right in the world. And, and then you also need a leader who is in it for the long haul and is able to create rituals around those beliefs so that those beliefs can easily be shared across an organization. And that organization is both employees as well as customers, partners, vendors, et cetera. I think that to me is like my unpacking of charisma. I think we think of charisma as like, this crazy over the top, yeah, like yeah. charming characteristic. And I don't think that matters candidly. Yeah, I, I think what matters is, do you believe in something? 
are you willing to take a stand and are you willing to take clear long-term rituals against solving that problem that you believe deeply in? And if you do, right. you can build a cult brand. And if you don't, you probably can't. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have a strong point of view. You have to have a founder who has a strong point of view and how their product is transformational. And then you need to be incredible at memes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, jokes and memes never hurt. Right? Come on. Um, I love that. But Kira, I, I want to play a little game. I want to play a little game in the show. Let's go. I think that we should name five or six cult brands of the future. Like who oh, do wow. we think, think are going to be, who are not cult brands today, who are going to be cult brands in the future? I will, I will start. Like yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to give, give, give you a softball. We've talked about it on the show. I'm a holder. I think Doodles is going to be a cult brand because it has all the making. It has clear you know, characters. Over Web three on huh? the day when Web, you're going strong. On I'm Web going 3 straight to Web three, day, baby. On the day when Web three is like. <laughs> Me and the other NFT holders, there's like yeah. five of us. We're left, baby. We're having a great time. <laughs> but, but look. First of all, that's exactly right. I should be going to Web3, Kieran, because we said that to build a cult brand, you have to challenge the status quo. Yeah, so why would I go to some boring thing? No, I'm going to Web3, baby. I'm talking about an NFT project called Doodles. What they have is they have great characters and art. They have clear rituals. They have these events that they're hosting kind of every quarter that you have to be a holder to go to. They're having different voting elements to engage in how you do different projects with, with money from the treasury. They have a clear clear leader in Julian who's like setting a roadmap and, and, and building more rituals. Like it's still really early days, but I would not be surprised if a decade from now, Doodles is a cult cult brand. So one cult brand of the future that I would give you is Doodles. What do you got, Kieran? I'm going to go for, I'm going to have to do a really easy one because I'm trying to <laughs> think of other cool ones. Uh, I'll probably go for Pickleball. Oh, I love that. Totally. Did a full, I think Pickleball a full, is a cult brand of the future. Yeah, We did a full episode of Pickleball. I think it has a lot of the things that you need to have a cult brand. Yeah. Uh, it gives people a sense of purpose. It gives people that competitive spirit, regardless of your age. It has a ton of things that keep people acting as a community. You can go on and see global leaderboards. You can go on and see places to play. You can go on and actually get matched against people of your level. Anywhere you are, you can get matched against people of your level to go play. So it has that community aspect. And I think it does challenge the status quo. Like it challenges that yeah. sports are for a specific category. Of, like those kind of sports are for a certain category of people. Like people who are in their athletic uh, you know, prime in terms of being able to compete. And it, and it kind of puts flips out on the head and says, it doesn't matter what age you are, you can always play a competitive sport. Pick, pickleball isn't a competitive sport. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you another, another example of a brand we both know that I think is going to be a cult brand, Wanderer. Wanderer. Yeah, that's a good one. So Wanderer is basically taking an owned approach to Airbnb. So they are building a whole community of owned homes that you can rent that have like a Tesla with them, workstations, high-speed Wi-Fi at all parts over the country. And I think they're going to be a catalyzing point for the nomadic movement. People who are don't want to live in one place year round and with remote work are going to live a few different places and they'll come together in like homes like this. And I think Wanderer has the opportunity to build rituals around these spaces and really be and become ultimately a cult brand. The last one I'll give is, you actually put me onto this and I've been trying oh. to do some research on it, but there's a brand in London, a clothes brand, streetwear brand called Cortez. I think it's after yeah. a rapper yeah. uh, who owns this, is going from strength. So they do all of these exclusive stunts. Yes, it's crazy. You sent, Amazing you sent marketing. the Instagram where they do these drops and like you have just hordes of people running around London trying to get their hands on this stuff. I think they have the ability to go cult brand because again, it really speaks to Gen Z. There's a real community aspect. There's a real sense of belong purpose. They are really cool in the way they create these kind of treasure hunts for their for their latest drops. The other one that's kind of interesting is like the Prime drink. Oh that, yeah. That the KSI and Logan Paul have done. There's a real cultish feeling about that brand. I just don't know if it has longevity. Like they're trying to pick a fight with Gatorade and some of these other companies. <laughs> That's their clear enemy, but they actually don't have a great selling point against, they're kind of don't have a great selling point against those companies. They're very much the same as those companies. The selling point is, hey, this is just for younger people. And okay. so uh, I'm, I'm unsure if they'll actually manage to 
you know, go all the way with that. All right, I'll, I'll give you one more because we've given people a bunch of consumer product examples. I don't want to give something that's not a consumer product. I think you know a little bit about this brand, but there's a there's an amazing company called Spline, and it's spline.design is the domain. And they do mm. collaborative and online 3D design and modeling. Oh, wow. And it is dope. And they have built this amazing product. They have a huge, vibrant community of users who are using this tool to build AR experiences, industrial design, 3D printing, all kinds of amazing use cases coming out of it. Hugely successful business. Still very early stage, but wow, I could see a world where they are, they have a a following of tens of millions of users around the world and become the default standard for how 3D design happens in the world. So think Figma, Canva, all of these things, but for free, for 3D design, I think it's a huge opportunity. That's awesome. I will check them out. I'm just on their website. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a sweet product. So those are a few cult brands of the future. We broke down well, all about cults. We gave you a little history lesson around cults. We took you through that to talk about how you take those lessons to actually build a cult brand. And again, Kira and I are doubling down. It has never been a better time to build a cult, an iconic brand than it is right now. And we could be more excited and we will see you very soon on Marketing Against the Grain. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history, calls, support tickets, emails, and here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot, grow better. 